All right, let's go ahead and take a look at this. I had asked you to draw the structural formula for 2-hexene. So again, let's talk about what we've got. Two implies the location of that double bond. Again, like we said, hex implies a number, so six carbon. Ene implies a double bond. So what do we have? We've got six carbons, one, two, three, four, five, and six. The location of our double bond is on carbon number two. So then what's everything else? Everything else is hydrogen, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Again, remember that for a double bond, it's CN, H2N, which should make sense. We've got C6, we've got H12, and we are done. So 2-hexene as the name and the structural formula. All right, I want to give you another one. This one's going to be a little bit more complicated, but um, this one's going to lead us into how we're going to go about doing what we're going to be doing next, which is the addition of something called functional groups. Um, but in order to do it, let's, let's take a look at another way that we will sometimes see these bonds. Let's say I had asked you to name a structure that looks like this. And you should say that does look profoundly different because notice now that as we look at this we don't just have one double bond but we now have two. So the question is well what are we going to do? Well let's start with remembering that it is double bonds, right? So we are going to want to look and see where that first carbon or the carbon closest to the double bonds are. So it's going to be here, which makes this carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, 4, and 5. But now we want to name it. Now remember, the very first thing we do is start by identifying the location of the double bonds. So double bond is located at, well, carbon 1. But this time it's located at more than carbon one. So we're going to say one, we're going to say comma, and then the second double bond is actually located at carbon number three, right? So we're going to say one comma three. Now we're going to say how many carbons. So dash, remember there's five, so penta or pent. Now usually we would say ene, right? We would say pentene. But since there's two double bonds, we're going to imply that that one and that three is for two double bonds. So we're going to use the prefix di, the suffix ene. So one comma three dash penta di for two ene to imply double bonds. All right, so then when we go about some another one like that, what if now we had one that looked like this. Let's get rid of that one so it's easier to see how would we go about naming a carbon structure that looked like this. Now how, now how is this significantly different as well? Well let's start with noticing that not only do we have a double bond but now we have a triple bond. All right, so the question is, what are we going to do? Well, same idea. So we're still starting at the carbon located closest to the end. It also needs to be located closest to the bond. So notice that the double bond is at this end. So this is going to be carbon one. So carbon one, carbon two, three, four, 
and 5. Now, for this one, because there's two different kinds of bonds here, we're going to start this time by starting with how many carbons there are present. So let's remember that there's five carbons present, right, which would be pent a. Uh. But now we need to imply where each of those bonds are. So we need to imply where that double bond is and where that triple bond is. And we didn't do it already like we normally would by putting it out in front. Now why? Because if we were to say one comma three out in front, it wouldn't imply where the double bond is and where the triple bond is. So instead, here's what we do. Because there's two different kinds of bonds, we're gonna start with that name Penta for how many? Then we're gonna put one dash in, then we're going to put 3 dash ein. So this ends up being called penta 1 dash in 3 dash ein. Now what does that imply? That simply implies penta for 5 carbons, 1 for the location of what? Well the double bond, 3 for the location of what? Well the triple bond and that's it. If you want to put a comma between the 1, e, and 3, ein, you can. Um, or you can just simply leave it as that. Penta 1 dash e, 3 dash ein, and you're done. Now that's a little complicated. We don't really see things like that that much. But I did at least want to show it to you just in case you might see it moving forward so that you would know what to do. Now again, the only reason you would do something like this would be if you had a double bond and a triple bond both present in the same molecule. Again, not common, but it's always, I suppose, possible. All right, let's talk about where we go from here, because we talked about naming these compounds based on their basic structures. Let's continue on, and let's talk about what we call a functional group. Now, functional groups are simply parts of a molecule that are basically additions, if you will. They are things that will branch off of a molecule that give a molecule its basic structure. Now, there's lots of them, all right? There's tons of functional groups we could look at. We're really going to only discuss a few, all right? Um, understand that with that in mind, because hydrocarbons can form really long chains, that there's an infinite number of possible organic compounds. We try to keep it simple. Um, now, with that in mind, we're, again, we are looking at alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, and we're also going to be looking at aromatics, which, as we discussed before, are what we call rings. All right, with that in mind, these are the kind of functional groups we're going to look at. Hydrocarbon functional groups, which basically just means groups of hydrocarbons coming off. Names, things like methyl, ethyl, propyl and so on. We're going to look and see how we get those names in just a minute, but those are what we mean when we say hydrocarbon functional groups. Other kinds of functional groups will include things like simple groups where we simply talk about like a hydroxyl, which you think about hydroxyl, that's like saying OH negative, right? Hydroxide. Um, carbonyl and then carboxyl. Now we'll look and see what those are or all of those are in just a minute, but those are some of our basics. Carbonyl is simply C with a double bond O attached to it. Carboxyl is C, double bond O, and then another O. All right, complex functional groups that we're going to look at, we're actually going to be responsible for. You have received a sheet um, at the end of your last quiz with these groups on them. They showed you the formulas and names, and you are responsible for memorizing those, right? You're going to take a quiz on those next week. I think it's next Monday. Um, but then ultimately, we're going to look at how to name compounds when we have these different functional groups, things like aldehydes, ketones, esters, ethers, carboxylic acids, halides, which basically just means a halogen attached, 
and then amides, amides, and amino acids, which simply are different structures that will contain uh, nitrogen, um, hydrogens, as well as other structures attached to them. All right, so with that in mind, let's talk about basic hydrocarbon functional groups. And simply put, these are the rules. We simply, we find the longest chain. That's called the parent chain. Um, it receives a prefix based on this. Kind of like what we just talked about, right? That if we have six carbons total in the chain, it gets the prefix hexa, or five carbons penta, or so on and so forth. Then we find any functional groups. Another word we're going to use for these groups when it deals with hydrocarbons or such is we're going to call them substituent groups. Now all a substituent group means is that it's not a part of the parent chain. And we're going to see what that means in just a minute. Then we number the carbon atoms on the parent chain starting closest to the smallest substituent group. Again, we'll see what that means in just a minute. Or closest to the double or triple bond if there is one. Then we name the compound using numbers to identify where the group is, prefixes to identify how many, and then finish with the parent chain. And again, we'll see what that means as we go through. All right, let's talk about first hydrocarbon functional groups. Now, to simply put, when we, a hydrocarbon becomes a functional group, what will happen is that ane, like methane, will become what we call methyl. Simply put, in the place of one of those hydrogens, that hydrocarbon will now be able to attach to something else making it CH3. So methane would become a methyl group. We'll see what that means in just a minute. Same idea. So C2H6, which is ethane, now becomes what? Well, it becomes an ethyl group. And we could do that for all of the hydrocarbons that we've all, all list, already listed. Methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, and so on could become a YL or OL simply by becoming a substituent group. All right, so what do they look like? Well, let's just take something like this structure. This is what we call a branched hydrocarbon. Um, and again, remember that we are looking, as we look at a structure like at this, at two things. We're looking at the parent chain, oftentimes called the root. So the parent chain and then the side chain, which again we said was called the substituent group. And based on those two things, we're looking at how we would go about naming it. So let's start with the first thing we're going to want to do is look for the chain with the most amount of carbons. Now, a couple things. One, we see the carbon listed here. Notice each of these points we don't actually see a carbon, but anytime we see something like this in organic chemistry where we see a point like this, that implies a carbon. So it's like saying there's a carbon there, and it's like saying there's a carbon there, and it's like saying there's a carbon here. It simply is another way that we could draw a hydrocarbon chain. It's actually called a condensed chain. So simply put, we could simply draw lines and by drawing those lines we're implying where those carbons are. So we've got a carbon, 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 carbon. So how many carbons is that? In this, I would start by once you've figured out which carbons are in the parent chain, circle them. So circle what you have in the parent chain because by doing that, that shows you what's not. So we know that this is the parent chain, all right, which means these things are not. If these things are not the parent chain, then those must be what we call substituent groups. All right, now what do we do? How do we name this? Well, let's start with, we start with the carbon closest to a substituent group. This would be carbon 2, 3, 4, and 5, which means this would be closest to the first substituent group. 
So carbon one, carbon two. All right, now, much like what we did with the double bonds, we need to identify where these substituent groups are. So we're going to start by saying two, comma, three. Now, understand why we're doing that. So we're identifying where both of those substituent groups are. So we're going to say two, because the first one's there, comma, three, because the second one's there. Now, notice they're both the same group, right? They're both methyl groups. So we'll say, remember, if we had more than one, we use the word prefix di. So we're going to say dimethyl. So di implies two. Methyl implies the hydrocarbon group we have. Now, remember, how do we know this is methyl? Well, because it was CH4. Now it's CH3 attached to something else. The way we know it's methyl is because there's only one carbon in this substituent group. If there had been two carbons in that group, it would have been ethyl, three, propyl, and so on and so forth. So two, comma, three, dimethyl. The two and the three told us the location. Di meant how many. Methyl meant the group. Now what else? Well, now we're simply going to name the parent chain, and that would be pent. They're all single bonds, so it would be ane, and we get 2,3-dimethylpentane. And that's it. That's how we would name a larger structure such as that. All right, a couple things. Notice that the root or the parent is the longest chain possible. Um, if there were any double or triple bonds, they would have to be in that. So if you had seen in that picture or that drawing a double or triple bond, it would have had to be in a part of the parent chain. Some common side chains will include things like these, um, methyl, ethyl, propyl, one other. It's called isopropyl. And all that simply means is that you think of propyl and propyl, well, we think three carbons, it could attach at either end. If this is the parent chain, and it attaches to that middle carbon, then it's called iso. Propyl. Think iso simply means attached to the middle carbon of the propyl group. All right. All right. So let's just take one. Let's say I asked you to name this. Now, again, we want to first figure out where the longest chain would be. So let's figure that out. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, let's start with notice all single bonds. So the ending has got to be ane, right? There's not a single double bond in there, so there's not going to be an ene or an ine. It simply is ane. All right, what else? All right, well, let's look at the longest chain. Notice the longest chain would be this one. Now, notice why. Because if we do this chain, notice we've got one, two, Notice why. Notice if we do this chain, notice we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons in that chain. Starting at this carbon would have only given us six. Starting here would have only given us six. Starting here would have only given us so many six. And so this has to be the parent chain. It's going to give us the longest or most amount of carbons. All right, what next? All right, we're going to attach the prefix according to the number. So how many? So notice, again, we said that there were how many? There was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we're going to say heptane. Now what? Now let's assign numbers to each carbon. All right, so where's the carbon closest to the first substituent group? And you're going to say this one. Notice what happens. Notice that carbon 1, carbon 2, 
Notice carbon 3 now has three methyl groups on I'm sorry, two methyl groups on it. Carbon 4, 5, 6, and 7. Now the big thing to notice, the reason why we started on that right carbon and not the left, because we could have started on either, is because if we start on that right carbon, notice that on carbon 3, there was not just one methyl group, but there were two of them. So what are we going to do now? All right, so we need to name those side chains. Notice they're all methyls, right, because they all contain just one carbon. So let's attach names for them, and it would look something like this. Now, we could name this a couple different ways. We could call this 3-dimethyl-5-methyl-heptane. So we could have called this 3-di-methyl-5-methyl-heptane. We could call this 3-methyl-3-methyl-5-methyl-heptane. We could have said this one, which is a, a little bit tricky, but you could have also done this. You could have said 3, 3, 5, tri, methyl, heptane, and they all would have implied the same thing, all right? They all would have implied that you had two methyl groups on the three, you had one methyl group on the five, and then you had seven single bonded carbon compound or structure. And that's it. All right. Name this. If you need to pause the video in order to name this, make sure you do so. Um, if not, and you just want to continue on, that is fine. Um, but simply naming this, you would get this. You would get 4-ethyl-3-methyl-4-octene. Now, a couple things are going on here. So one, again, we want to identify where that parent chain is. So we notice there is a double bond. So we are going to end up with that ene on the end. We need the longest chain possible. It's got to include that double bond. So it ends up being this. Notice that's got the most carbons. Notice 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So we got 8 carbons total, which means these two groups over here are substituent groups, right? So substituent groups, or we could call them side groups. All right, so notice what happened. Now, first of all, we want to be on the side closest to what? Well, closest to a substituent group, as in the smallest substituent group, but also then to the double bond. Since the double bond is on the same from either side, it doesn't matter which side we start on until we start looking and seeing that there's a substituent group right here, making this have to be carbon 1. So we got carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Notice then that methyl group is on carbon 3. Notice we've got a group with two carbons on it on carbon 4. Two would mean not methyl, but ethyl. And then notice the double bond is also on carbon 4. Now, a couple things to notice. So we said 4-ethyl, 3-methyl, 4-octene. Notice that we put them in order of ethyl and then methyl. We're always going to put, so make a note of this, we're always going to put our side chains in alphabetical order. 
So we put the ethyl first because it simply alphabetically comes, the E comes before the M, and that would be it. If there had been a propyl in there, well, we would have put it based on alphabetically or butyl or whatever it was, would be based solely on where it is alphabetically. If you should have any questions about that, please don't hesitate to ask. Tomorrow in class, um, you're going to actually be doing an activity that's going to give you a chance to practice making some really complex structures um, such as these and writing their formulas and naming them and all of that. All right, let's practice a couple. So practice this one. When you finish this one, y'all, I'm going to stop with this one and then I'm going to give... Uh, Miss Golson a chance to pass you out your practice for tomorrow. Your practice for tomorrow, homework wise, is going to be very basic. It's just going to review what you did actually the day before and then tomorrow you're going to get a whole period to work on making the large complex ones. But go ahead and pause the video here so that you can name this structure and, um, and then we'll go from there. Okay, again, first thing we do is find the longest chain. So this is the longest chain, which means one substituent group on the end. It's this group right here. We're going to call that a methyl group. So we get three methyl hexane. All right, let's do another one. Again, pause the video so that you can work through this one and then see what you get. All right, we take a look at this one. Again, notice our parent chain. It's got to have the most amount of carbons on it, which means these other three groups, this and this. And this and this are our substituent groups. So notice how we name it. For ethyl, again, remember alphabetically, right? So we're going to put the ethyl first. 2, 3, dimethyl. Notice we wrote both the 2, the 3. Dimethyl implies two methyl groups. We see where they're located. And then hept, ane, right? Hept because there's seven carbon. Ane because they're all single bonded. All right, again, pause the video so that you can do this one. All right, notice the carbon chain is a really long chain. Notice again, all these other groups over here are all substituent groups. So we see three methyl groups. We see an ethyl group at the bottom. All right, and it's this, 5-methyl. 2, 4, 6, trimethyl, and then octane, and we're done. That's it. All right, y'all, again, if you should have any questions about any of those, please do not hesitate to ask. Otherwise, we're going to stop here. Uh, Ms. Golson is going to pass out to you some practice that is related to the problems we did yesterday in class. Tomorrow, you're going to get a whole period to practice making a bunch of these kinds of structures. And then after that, we're going to start adding on some of the more complex functional groups. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, otherwise, I hope you have a great day.